Good morning, everybody. I'm going to ask if you'd stand with me, please, as I share a scripture, as our call to worship. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online. We were not able to do so last week. We had some quarantining, and but now we're all back and uh, ready to go. And so we are glad that you're with us. Just a reminder, if during the course of the service you have prayer requests or praise reports that you'd like us to include, uh, we want you to text those to the number that's showing up on your screen. Uh, we certainly want to stay connected, not only here, but also over the airwaves. Psalm 27. See, they're already calling in. Oh, it's Dick. This uh, scripture came to mind over the last day or so, and I feel it's important that I read it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Lord, we bless and praise your name that you are our light and our salvation. We look at the events that took place this past week. We see it seems increasing chaos. Um, but Lord, you never panic and you never relinquish your throne. You are the Lord God Almighty, and in you we find a place of security and safety. And so therefore, we will make music to the Lord. We will sing praise to our God. We will draw near to you and with one another praise the name of our God. I pray, Lord, for what you have in store for this service. It will be different than we've normally had, but it will be, we believe, tr uh, and trusting to be the case that it will be led by your Holy Spirit in a way that your people are encouraged, your people are empowered, and we are sent forth, God, as witnesses to the good news of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. If you'd remain standing.
place into your loving hands. We want to do that right now for three serious requests, or actually four, I think, that have come in that I want to make you aware of. I was just on the phone with Carla Decker. Uh, some of you may be aware, we've tried to get this out in the prayer chain. Al was taken to emergency last night. He was having trouble walking uh, and talking. Um, they weren't sure whether it was pre-stroke or whatever. He had an incident like this a while back, uh, but it was associated with a fever. Uh, when they did his blood pressure, it was 205 over 109. Um, they've been trying to get it down, um, but Carla said they kept him in overnight. Uh, but we're going to go to the Lord and pray for our brother Al. We also got word last night that Terry Bardis' son, Ed, uh, was taken to the hospital. Um, he had an accident. Uh, let me just get this up. Where's Terry? Terry, you could possibly give us more, but what I've got here, this is from Heather, uh, Ed's uh, wife. It says, I've been praying that they would be able to get him into surgery quicker. He had a table saw accident uh, with his hand. Um, he's being taken down for surgery this morning. Um, Ed has requested prayer for the following. So please agree with me in prayer that all tendons, muscles, nerves, bones, etc., will be put back in place and no loss of fingers and for a restoration of complete function. Also pray that all other aspects of surgery go well, including anesthesia and no pain, no anxiety. Thank you and much love to all of you for your prayers and support. Uh, was there anything further, Terry, that you needed to add to that? Okay, so that's the latest I got. Uh, we also want to keep Terry and her family in prayer. It's bittersweet um, in the sense that their mom is with Jesus and no longer in pain, but it's still tough to lose a parent. So we want to pray there. Also received a call in from, a uh, text in from Brenda Southworth. Um, she's asking prayer for her three-year-old grandson. He was taken to the hospital last night with high fever, chills, and vomiting. Uh, they assume COVID. We're waiting for test results. I believe they came back negative. Um, but also she wants prayer. Her younger brother, Brian, had a severe heart attack last night and needs prayers. Now, we started with three worship songs before we took these needs to the Lord in prayer. First of all, because the Bible says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. But secondly, to encourage you in your faith, I place all that I am to your loving hands. Before I shared these prayer requests with you, that was true. I just shared these prayer requests with you. It's still true. Nothing changed. The Lord was God at the start of the week, and the Lord is God at the end of the week. And so we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and what I'd like to ask you to do, the chairs are clean, so don't worry about that, but I'm going to ask you to find a place to kneel right where you are, and let's just do an old-fashioned prayer, intercession, where we get on our face before God, and we just start lifting up these requests. We're not going to have one person in particular pray for them, but the whole family of God, let's just find that place of prayer. Uh, if the worship team wants to play just instrumentally, that would be fine. But let's just find a place of prayer, and let's just take some time in prayer. For Al, for the Miller Bartus family, for Ed Bartus, for uh, Brenda's grandson Jonathan and her younger brother Brian, let's just spend some time in prayer with the Father.
Oh Lord, thank you that you have not left us as orphans. Thank you that you have sent your Holy Spirit to be in us, for us to become the dwelling place of God, no longer a tabernacle made of skins of animals and wood, no longer a, a temple made with stone, but a human temple individually and corporately, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Thank you that your spirit has taken up residence within us and that you are conforming us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ through every experience we have. Thank you that you are the faithful God and we trust you. And we look forward to what you have in store, Lord, for us and for this church, for your church in the days ahead. Thank you that we have been able to lift our requests before you. And like incense, they have risen before you. We have mingled the prayers with the praises in obedience to the word of God. We have placed our cares in your hands because you care for us. And we thank you, God, for the way you will answer to bring your name honor. In Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. You may be seated for a moment. 
And if you will take your Bibles, please, thank you. We're going to have more worship a little bit later on, but I'm going to draw your attention in the Bibles to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament just before the Gospel of Matthew. Malachi chapter 3. I had intended originally to continue the theme that I introduced last week about using our testimony, our story, as a way of sharing the gospel with those who don't know Christ. But in light of the events of this past week, thanks, in our nation's capital, I felt compelled to change direction. There are times when events take place locally, regionally, statewide, nationally, or even worldwide that I believe necessitate a pastoral response. Last year it was the coronavirus. When it came out there were all kinds of comments and discussions about conspiracies, the coronavirus conspiracy. And I had people ask me, Pastor Ray, do you believe this is the end? And so I believed it was important to provide a pastoral response. And the reason for that is so often when events happen, our initial reaction is a reaction. In other words, we get caught up in the emotion of the event. We get caught up with what's going on and we become reactors instead of responders. We act more like thermometers than we do thermostats. We let the environment affect us and we get all caught up and riled up inside, filled with all kinds of emotion instead of thermostats, responding to the situation and bringing grace and truth to bear. And so that's why I believe it's important we do so. Now, I said I did it with coronavirus two years ago. I did it with the expansion of abortion when the capital of Albany, the legislators ended up expanding it and then they lit up the skyscrapers in New York City praising this. I felt again there was a need for a pastoral response. And so in light of the events that took place this week, uh, Wednesday and Thursday with the capital, Tuesday in Georgia, and going all the way back to the election in November, there's a lot of emotion out there, and I believe that it's important for us as the people of God to go to the word of the Lord and say, Lord, how do you want us to navigate these times? Because we're hearing a lot of things, and social media is just blasting with all kinds of responses from people. So how do we respond? Well, I believe Malachi provides us with a start, and so if you'd stand now, I want to read with you a few verses from Malachi chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. You have said it is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements? and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty. But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, and the day when I make up my treasured possession, I will spare them, just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Lord, these are times in which our faith can be shaken, if we take our eyes off you. These are times that could stir us up and cause us to respond or react in anger and in fear and in confusion. 
but you want us to respond as the people of God. Lord, I pray that you will direct my words to keep them true to your word, to keep us focused, to be biblically balanced with grace and truth. The same Holy Spirit that we sang about coming here, I pray would open our hearts and minds to what you want to say to us and that your Holy Spirit would rest upon your servant. Superintend, Lord, so that I simply become the vessel and it's your spirit that does the work to glorify Jesus here. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. On Friday this past week, I had to go over to a don't eye care to get my glasses adjusted. I uh, lacked depth perception when I opened my van door. And uh, they were every which way but loose kind of thing. And so I went over there, and when I walked in through the door, my son Ben, who works there, greeted me, and he had this. And he scanned me to make sure I didn't have a fever. Oh, excuse me, yeah, fever. I was going to say temperature. Everyone has a temperature, fever. And it came out 97.5. I am good. Wouldn't it be wonderful, though, if we had one of these that measured not just the physical temperature, but the emotional temperature? Because i got to tell you, if we use one of these this week, this thing would have probably blown up. Because when you look across the nation, there are different emotions that people are feeling. And before I look at a biblical response, I want to set the stage. This morning's message is not a political speech for one party or another. I'm to stand here behind the pulpit and preach, thus saith the Lord, this is the word of God. But I also want to ground it in context, in settings, so you understand why I'm sharing what I'm sharing. You see, there are a group of people that are out there today numbering in the millions, who if you took that scan and went like this across their head, it would say exuberant. It would say jubilant. It would say ecstatic. Because they believe that they have vanquished the great monster that has been in the White House for four years. They believe that not only have they vanquished this great monster, this fascist, this evil monster, they have defeated the president's party as well. And they believe that now, finally, they can enact an agenda that they believe will be good for the country. They believe that they will finally be able to right the wrongs of our country and of its founding and its failures through its existence. They truly believe that they have what is in the best interest of our nation. They believe that they will be able to bring about justice economically, that the haves and the have-nots will no longer be separated, that by redistributing wealth it will be fair for everybody, that racial injustice that has permeated systemically every part of society will be addressed. They believe that the nation is unsafe and that by limiting the number of firearms that it will keep the nation safe. They believe by enacting policies they will make a healthier and greener world. They believe that they will make it safer for the nation in terms of health care. They want to fundamentally transform society in accordance with what they believe will be the best agenda for this nation. They also believe that those who support the current president as well as the president deserve to be punished for what they've done to this country. They should be expelled from positions of power. They should be stifled in their speech and silenced because their speech is hateful, their speech is divisive and needs to be stopped and that the force of government needs to be put down on them to stop it. They believe that institutions that stand in the way of equality and justice and diversity and tolerance need to have the full weight of government brought against them so that this society can be just and fair to everyone and that the marginalized and the dispossessed will no longer be so, but that we will not only have equal opportunity but equal, op uh, e equal outcome, and that is the only way to make sure that society will be fair for everyone. 
So they are exuberant because they believe finally there are no restrictions. Taking the House and the Senate and the presidency, they will be able to enact it with no restriction. Among this group, there are also some that if you register, it would be very angry. They're very angry at people that stand in the way of their agenda, and they believe that they need to be dealt with, even if it means pulling them off of platforms of free speech, that rights need to be curtailed for the good of the nation. Now, there's another group of people that if you were to scan them, theirs is hopeful. Theirs is um, glad. They don't take the agenda of the first group to its fullest extent, but they are certainly sympathetic with a number of its goals. But they're just thankful that the very unpredictable man that has been in the White House has been defeated. They believe it's important that we get back to the way things were before this president was in power. They believe he has been temperamentally unfit for the office since he began. They believe that his language his, and rhetoric is divisive and inflammatory. They're absolutely shocked and angry at what happened this past week and lay it primarily at the feet of the president. And so in their mind, they're hopeful that finally with this president gone, that our country can get back to normal. There's a third group that you'll find if you put the scan upon their heads would be sad, disappointed. They appreciated the policy direction of the last four years. They believe that the policies that were enacted were in line with the founding fathers' principles. They believe that a strong national defense, an economic system that allows for the freedom of people to rise through the ranks education reform and some of the other reforms that have been instituted, some of the trade deals that were renegotiated were all in the best interests of the country. They look at the first group and they say that the first group simply wants America to be one of many nations among a global family. This third group believes that America is unique. And so they liked the policies of the president. However, if you scan them again, you would find them appalled at some of the rhetoric of the president. They would cringe whenever some of his tweets would go out. This is best represented by a gentleman that I do not know personally, but know of him, who said, I agree with 80% of the president's policies, but only 20% of his tweets. They're appalled at everything that took place this past week in Washington. And uh, although you know they don't disagree with the policies, they have a real trouble with some of the rhetoric. Then if you got to the fourth group of people, again, numbering in the millions, and you did an emotional scan for them, many of them would fall under the category of angry. They are angry because they believe the election was fixed, they believe there was fraud, and that the party that's going to be in power illegally and illegitimately claimed that power. Some of them are angry enough that they've used words like revolution, overthrow. They are angry angry because they believe that the legitimate president should have continued another four years and that we have now been thrust with someone that is not legitimately elected. Among this group, there's also, if you did the scan, it wouldn't just be angry, it would be fr afraid, frightened, scared. They are terrified of the agenda of the first group because they believe it will lead not to more justice, but more injustice. They believe it will not lead to more tolerance, but intolerance. They do not believe it will lead to more freedom, but less freedom. They're afraid of what it might mean. And for those in that fourth group that uh, would qualify as evangelical Christians, they're terrified of what it might mean for the church. They don't know if the power of government will be brought against anyone and that only those who conform to the uh, group speak will be acceptable and anyone that dares to stand and say, thus saith the Lord, will face the wrath of the government. They are frightened for the future, for themselves and for their children. But in that group and some overlap, there's also another one, and that would be confused of this fourth group. They're confused because they truly believe that God had raised up the president 
had put him into par power for such a time as this to turn America back towards God. They believed that the prophecies had been spoken, that this president was to serve eight years, that he was God's man for the job, and that although he may have said some things that were considered inappropriate, he was God's Cyrus, and that God anointed him, and God prophesied he was going to serve. And so because he lost, they're now confused. They don't understand. How could this happen? If you're God, why did you allow this? What is going on? Now, I don't want you to believe that the Christians only are in the fourth group. There are Christians, those who would name the name of Christ, in all four groups. Now, those who are in group four in particular say there is no way on God's green earth there could be somebody in group one and call themselves a Christian. Well, there are those in group one that can't believe somebody in group four could call themselves a Christian. See, those in group three and four say, how can groups one and two be Christian because they have policies that are contrary to the will and word of God? Groups one and two say, how can you be Christian, groups three and four, and support a man that did the things he did? And so there's a lot of emotion, a lot of division, and a lot of anger, a lot of fear, joy, a whole bunch of scanned emotions. That's the stage that we find ourselves in today. Now, I don't know what group you find yourselves in, and I know I'm painting with a broad brush. I acknowledge that. There's probably some overlap. But I personally know people, friends that I have known for 30 years, relatives of mine, that fall in the different groups that I've mentioned. Many of them love Jesus just as much as I do. Different place. But the issue is not where you find yourself. The issue is where are you going? How will you, no matter what group you're in, how will you navigate forward as the people of God? Because the Lord has not changed. In group one, two, three, or four, the Lord has not changed. So as I was praying and putting this together, there are four thoughts, and on the back of your bulletin, you can jot these down. This may be one of those messages that you want to kind of keep and refer to. But I want to share with you some thoughts that I think apply to the entire situation. I'm not going to speak to one particular group, but I want to speak to the church here. And I know that there are many, many more watching the service. We've been following the numbers, and what we're finding is two times, as, three times as many are watching this service, and many who are not even part of our church, but are watching the service. And so it's important that we present the whole counsel of God. And so let me, let me lay out for you, if, number one is this, a foundation built on sand will not endure. A foundation built on sand will not endure. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. If you lived in 125 A.D., you lived in the midst of an empire that was considered one of the greatest empires the world had ever known. 20% of the world's population lived under the flag of Rome, the banner of Rome. It controlled territory from Great Britain all the way over to right against the Persian, well, what would have been the Persian uh, Empire. At its height, all this emperor had to do was speak a word, and his will was carried out like he was a god. Where's the Roman Empire today? It's gone. If you had lived somewhere around 1450, 1460 BC, and had traveled to Egypt, you would have found an empire known as the Egyptian Empire that ruled vast land and peoples. Where's the Egyptian Empire? It's gone. So is the Sumerian. 
So is the Babylonian. So is the Assyrian. So is the Ming Dynasty, the Han Dynasty, the Holy Roman Emperor, the Third Reich, the Soviet Union. Shall I go on? Every empire that is built on a foundation that is not in accordance with the word of God is destined to fail. And ultimately, we're never going to get a perfect empire or kingdom anyhow until Jesus returns. But when you build a kingdom, when you build a nation on principles that violate the word of God, they cannot survive as a nation. We are finding our country in many places moving towards philosophies and policies that are in direct contradiction to what the Word of God says about human nature. The pilgrims tried socialism. It lasted one season. Now these were Christians who had the book of Acts about sharing your goods. If anybody was going to get it right, it would have been them. They came for freedom. And after one season, they said, this isn't working. It's like the professor's story that I've told you before about a professor that gave an exam, and when the exam was done, he said to all those who had studied and got A's, guess what? We're going to implement a socialistic way of measuring grades here. All of you that got A's, I'm going to take some of your good grade and give it to the people that got F's. And so now the F's got D's, and the A's got B's. So guess what happened on the next test? The people that got A's the first time didn't study as hard. And the people that got D's didn't study at all. So the B's got C's and the D's got C's. By the time the term was over, everybody failed. Nobody was trying. There is within the human breast created by God, going back to the original creation before the fall, there is within the human breast a cry we are created in the image of God. We were created to have freedom and to serve and worship the Lord God. When we reject that freedom, we then become in bondage. But God originally created us for freedom. And when you pass policies that will limit the freedom with responsibility, ultimately it is destined to fall. If you had lived during the time of the Soviet Union, they had such absolute sway and power and because of their secret police and all they did, they had tight, tight control. And yet Gorbachev had to acknowledge with the breakup of the Soviet Union, it didn't work. Right now, it looks like China is in ascendancy. 1940s became communist, but the seeds of its own destruction are there. 30, 20, 30 years ago, gone to Venezuela, it was the fourth richest economy. Where is it now? People are eating dogs, pets. And garbage. You cannot build a system. And so there are those who believe that the problem has been we just didn't have smart enough people running the system. The problem with that approach is it's arrogant for one thing, but secondly, it isn't about the system in terms of running it. The problem is fundamentally the presuppositions are incorrect. They will not work. They cannot work. A foundation built on sand, will not endure. Secondly, well, let me just, two other things here. Daniel chapter 9, uh, excuse me, chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. This is a, uh, Daniel praying. Because see, those who are in power right now, or will be in power, believe that, and they will try everything within their power to consolidate that power. And that's, again, a problem that happens, you know, Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady from Britain said, at some point, socialism, the problem with socialism is you run out of other people's money. You know, at some point, it does crash. And those who are in power, and this is what happens eventually with those who implement these systems, is they have to wield more and more power because what they're doing isn't working until finally, the ones who prosper are the very, very top, and everybody else will suffer. It's just, it's never worked anywhere that it's been tried. And those who are in power believe that they're in power and that they should be in power. But here's what Daniel said. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel prayed the God to the God of heaven, or praised the God of heaven, and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings. 
He sets up kings. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. There are those who have taken power or will take power that believe that it is rightfully theirs and they have the only reason they're in power is because God himself has allowed it for this season. Now that's not to say that everything that those who are in power want to do is going to be bad. Some of it actually may be positive. I'm just simply pointing out that a foundation built on sand will not endure. And in fact, and here's the frightening part of warning to those who are going to be taking power, and if they're watching the broadcast today, I say this in fearful trembling and God's redemptive grace. Romans 9, 17, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. That's a scary thing. Pharaoh, who was allowed to oppress God's people, was raised up for one purpose, so that God could use him to display his power by bringing Israel out of bondage in Egypt. By the time God, done, God got done with Pharaoh, and Pharaoh had hardened his heart, Egypt was ruined. But God's people were delivered. A foundation built on sand will not endure. Secondly, the Lord chooses the one he will use as his servant. I know that some of my friends that I know and Facebook friends have commented about how much they cannot stand the current president of the United States, cannot believe that there are Christians that would even vote for him. And, uh, and I, I reflected on and thought about that, and it came to me, God is sovereign. God can choose to use whomever he wants. Check this out. Jeremiah 25. Therefore the Lord Almighty says this, Because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant, Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah, you must have had bad pizza the night before to write that one. There's some, there's some funky pepperoni. How on earth, Jeremiah, could you call Nebuchadnezzar, under the inspiration of the Spirit, my servant? The guy was a pagan king. He ripped babies apart. He smashed them against the walls. He destroyed the temple. He destroyed the Jerusalem. He killed kings. He was horrible. He was arrogant. He was boastful. He said, is not this Babylon that I have created my empire? He was horrific. And Jeremiah calls him my servant? You've got to be kidding me, Lord. Or how about this one? Isaiah 45, verse 1. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus. You know what the word anointed means? Oh, that's the word we get Messiah from. The anointed one. Like as in oil on their head anointed to do my will. God, how on earth can you call a pagan idolater an anointed one? Whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor to open doors before him so the gates will not be shut. There are those who look at the president and groups three and four who will say that he has taken a stand for religious freedom, that he has not been hesitant to mention Jesus. The groups one and two will say he's just using Jesus to get his agenda. But there's no question that his desire was to roll back what he believed were some of the incorrect policies of the previous administration to advance the cause of freedom religiously, not just in this nation, but around the world. And the issues of life, not only in this country, but in the world, around the world. 
Now, there are some that will claim, and you may be here as well, you're one of those that say there's no way on God's green earth that God could have used the current president. And all I say to you is talk to God about Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus and then make up your mind. It's just possible that God might have raised him up for such a time as this. But, number three, character matters. Character matters. There are those that I have heard that have stood firmly in the camp of this president that will excuse his behavior because they say he's one of ours, but stood in judgment over the 42nd president for what he did in the White House, in the Oval Office. Do you know what groups one and two say about people that do that? Hypocrite! Because he's your guy, you're okay with things that he says. But our guy, you're not. If we're going to be consistent as children of God, then we need to call out the inappropriate behavior wherever it is found. In whatever party it is found, whenever it does not line up with the word of God. It is inexcusable to use language that is contrary to the will and word of God. The Bible says that if we call ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, we're not to let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. I have witnessed Christian after Christian that I know that on Facebook, without filter, has used language that does not glorify the Lord. Character matters. Jesus said in Matthew 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. It's not a matter of, see, Phil Zodati, prophetic minister, said this, God values character over gifting. God values character over gifting. Never once are we told, you shall know them by their gifts. But we are told you shall know them by their fruit. And as followers of Jesus Christ, if we are going to make a difference in this world, then we've got to reflect Jesus Christ. And when Christians, those who claim the name of Christ, excuse behaviors because they kind of like what the, the president is saying against a particular group or a particular policy, um, and, and they, yeah, 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 and we start spilling vomitous stuff on... How, how on earth is the world going to look at a Christian and say, you're different? If we're not careful, we will equate politics with the kingdom of God, and they are not the same. I am a citizen of heaven, and my citizenship in heaven ought to affect my citizenship on earth, not the other way around. When you've got people that are screaming and yelling and protesting all kinds of vile stuff against the other side and yet carrying a banner, Jesus saves, there's a little bit of a mixed message there. It's causing confusion for the cause of Christ. Character matters. And although we may be thrilled because certain policies are advanced, we cannot take a policy and divorce it from the character of the person. Character matters. One more point. The Lord will often use a setback as a set up for his glory to be revealed. The Lord will often use a setback as a set up for his glory to be revealed. I've been pondering this thought this week. There are those, as I said, with the scanner that read angry, furious, frightened, confused. When's the last time you meditated on Proverbs 2130? There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Is it possible the reason you're angry and afraid and confused because you really don't trust that God is in charge. I'm not here to slam you. I'm here to challenge you. 
If you and I truly believe that God is sovereign of the universe and you believe that the election was rigged, do you know that God at any time could have stepped in? Do you know that God at any time over the last two months could have stepped in? Do you believe that God could have stepped in? There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Isaiah put it this way, speaking for God, when I speak it, who can change it? Sometimes when God speaks, we interpret what he says in a way that makes sense to us, but may not be the way he intends to fulfill it. How many of you know well the story of Joseph in the Old Testament? Joseph, here is a dream from God. You will be raised up to power and your mom and your dad and your brothers will bow before you. Yes, this is going to be a, Can I share my dream with you all? It's a good one. I hate him. I hate him. So do I, Judah. I hate him. So do I, Benjamin. I got an idea. Let's get rid of this dreamer. We'll see what happens to his dreams. Well, killing him is probably the wrong thing to do. Ooh, we could sell him into slavery. Ha, that'll work. What a setback for Joseph. I'm going to rule. I'm being ruled. Does not compute. Raised up in Potiphar's house, starts to have some authority, doing well. Falsely accused of rape. Set back. Now he's in prison. Does not compute. This is not what I had in mind. I expected power, rule, control. I got nothing. I'm in prison. He begins to rise to position of authority in the prison. Two of Pharaoh's servants have dreams. He interprets the dreams. He says, please, could you remember me to Pharaoh? Sure, sure. He forgets. Two more years. Two more years. Wasting away in a prison cell. We're now about 13 years since the dream was spoken. He is, in his mind, nowhere near the dream being fulfilled. But each supposed setback was a step up, a set up by God to move him ever closer to God's purposes being fulfilled in his life. Genesis chapter 50. The brothers come to Joseph, after their father is dead, they're concerned that Joseph's going to take revenge. So they make up this speech. This is what you're to say to Joseph. This is supposedly what Jacob said. This is what you're to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, told you so. No, he didn't do that, did he? <laughs> Finally, ha <laughs> ha, gotcha, suckers. Nope, here's what he said. Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. The problem with us, and sometimes it may have been with Joseph, is that we take a snapshot of life instead of a video. And the snapshot really looks bad setbacks. But we don't always understand that God is working behind the scenes to set us up for that next place he has for us and for his glory to be revealed. 
So, Pastor, what do you believe God is saying to us? Is it possible that the prophets were just wrong? We had a number of prophets I remember reading and hearing about that said he was going to be eight years. And then someone said, yeah, but nowhere did it say it was going to be eight consecutive years. And so they're holding on to the fact that maybe four years from now he'll be back in office. I suppose it's possible. But what if there's more? And I am going to share this with you not because I definitely believe it's God, but because I want to do what Malachi says. They talk with each other. I just want to share with you some thoughts. If you don't like them, there's a trash can to the right when you walk out. And we'll have the arrow facing out so you can walk out and put it there. But I've had to give this a lot of thought. Because I know that I have heard from a lot of people that are really scared. We're hearing about uh, Facebook and Twitter and some of these others shutting down, censoring. Uh, we're hearing now in terms of Apple uh, shutting down and different stores shutting down apps. We see what appears to be censorship, 1984. And, uh, and we're wondering, God, where is this going? So let me, let me share with you some thoughts where I'm at, mulling over some of the things. Number one, and this isn't for, I don't have any one, two, three, four, this is just my thoughts on the conclusion part. Is it possible that the prophetic word was conditional? Oh, that's a nice cop out, Pastor Ray. Really? If you were a Ninevite in about 600, 25, 650 B.C., you are very, very thankful that Jonah's word was conditional. In 40 days, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Nineveh wasn't destroyed. Was the prophet wrong? It was a conditional prophecy. Although the condition is never mentioned, the condition was, unless you repent. Nineveh and the king of Nineveh repented. The king put on sackcloth. He called every, he even put sackcloth on the animals just to make sure he was covered. And God extended mercy to Nineveh. And they lived another, I think, 30, 40 years before they finally were overcome by the Babylonian Empire. It was a conditional prophecy. Sometimes prophecy is conditioned. Sometimes it's unconditional. When God raised up Saul, his reign was conditioned upon his following God's commands. What happened to King Saul? Samuel told him, here's what you need to do. Wipe out this whole group of people. He didn't. And because he didn't, Esther had to be raised up to save her people from a descendant of the people that Saul failed to address. Saul was told, your dynasty will not endure. Why? Because he disobeyed God's command. Unconditional was given to David, a man after God's own heart. He said, you will always have a descendant. And we know that ultimately was fulfilled with Jesus Christ. Sometimes prophecies are conditioned. Sometimes they're unconditional. So how does that play out? Supposition, hypothesis. What if those who believe in group four are correct that the election was fraudulent? I'm not saying if it is or isn't, I'm just saying what if. And what if instead of raging and doing everything that the president chose to do, he understood that this was a spiritual battle instead of a physical one. And he and his team got on their face before God and began to intercede and pray. What if God's intention was different? But the president failed to display the character necessary. 
instead of dealing with it in a biblical way, chose to respond as a New Yorker. I'm not saying that happened, but what I'm saying is there's another way of looking at this. It is possible that the president's prophecy that some believe they had was conditioned upon his response. And it's possible that because of the way he acted and the response that he has had, he, like Saul, may have forfeited. He may have been chosen as a servant, but because of his refusal to allow the grace of God to transform his life, he may have forfeited his possibility of continuing. Or like Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar was warned by God a year before that danger is coming unless you repent. And a year later, he stood on the walls of his city and said, this is Babylon, my empire that I've created. And a voice from God spoke. And he was driven out of power and for seven years ate grass like an animal. And after seven years, it says his sanity was restored. And he said, I have come to realize there is only one sovereign God. I don't know, maybe. Or condition, what if the condition was the church? Not necessarily a local church, but the church, the big C. Back in September, I brought a word from the Lord that he was calling the church to four actions. Number one, to repent. I took us to Revelation chapters 2 and 3 and pointed out that five out of seven churches had something that needed to be addressed and God called them to repent. Only Smyrna and Philadelphia escaped. And it says in chapter 2 of Revelation to the church of Ephesus, those whom I love, I chasten. What if God's call to repentance that went out wasn't picked up by the church and the church in some way failed to repent? What if God knows that the awakening to come can't come to a mixed impure church? And what if, what if the church needs to go through some pressure to clean out dead wood and to purify it? Oh, Pastor Ray, now you're really starting to, to get heavy and scary. No. The early church in 125 AD did not have their faith in the emperor, but in Emmanuel. They trusted, and if I could put it in our language, they trusted the rider on the white horse more than the one who was in the White House. The early church went through 10 persecutions in the first 300 years of its history. Not one of them destroyed the church. Every one of them purified the church of dead wood and brought in all kinds of living people to know Christ. And within 300 years, it had won the heart of the empire. What if in God's infinite wisdom, the revival awakening we're praying for would not have come given where the current president is and given where the current church is? Third thought, what if God's desire is not just to bring an awakening, but to revive the country? Right now, half the country has bought into a philosophy and a policy that is going to be destructive to the nation. What if in God's wisdom, he allows the nation to experience the fruits of what they've chosen for two or four years to finally get it out of its system? God allowed Israel to experience judgment. He brought them into Babylonian captivity. And once Babylonian captivity was over, never again did they go back to idolatry. They became fiercely monotheistic. It finally got shaken out of their system. Because every time they heard the warnings of the prophets, every time, they, oh, yeah, 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 okay, we're sorry, we're sorry. Oh, we love Jesus. Or in the Old Testament, we love Yahweh. Yeah, 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 okay, we'll serve him. Okay, now we can do what we want again. It wasn't until God worked it out of their system and said, I am not joking. It says in, in the book of Peter, judgment begins with the household of God. If you look at some of the doctrines that are being taught in churches today, and I'm not talking about churches that have walked away from the gospel. I'm talking about churches that claim Jesus. There is a lot of junk that is being taught in the name of Jesus. We just heard this one lady 
a famous lady that said that the Holy Spirit to her is like the blue genie of Aladdin. He's sneaky. What? What? And this is a high profile. This is Pergamum. The church of Pergamum that falls prey to Pentecostal silliness. This isn't a church that says we don't believe the Bible. This is a church, oh, we believe the Bible. That's sick. We have another pastor that says that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the same person. That there's one, one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit are one person. Not one God, but one person, same person. They're just changing forms. That's a heresy known as modalism. Folks, God is calling the church to holiness and righteousness and faithfulness to the word of God. What if the church didn't get the message? And What if God in his infinite grace is saying, I'm going to give the church another chance? But it's not going to come through my whisper this time. It's going to come through my rod. Now, if you're part of a church that's Philadelphia or Smyrna, stay close to Jesus. We're going to be all right. He promised the Smyrna church he'd protect them, and he promised the Philadelphia church they'll never stop having a mission. But what if it's the church? What if it was the president? What if God needs to teach us something? What if God is giving a setback so he could set up the greatest awakening our nation has ever heard? I want to make a bold statement. But I want the awakening more than I want a particular party in power. I don't want a nation at rest in sin going to judgment. I want an awakening where hundreds and thousands of people are brought into the kingdom. As I prayed over the last four years and three months, because God called me to be an intercessor in September, October 2016, and every day I have stood in the gap interceding for this nation, I have prayed and prayed and prayed. And I have prayed sometimes things that I thought would be good, and then other times I just prayed in the Spirit to make sure they were good. And I kept praying. But through it all, I said, ultimately what I want is the will of God. I want the will of God. And since God is sovereign, I am going to accept the fact that right now we are in the will of God. And that God has ordained whatever is coming in the days ahead. And that as your pastor, I will continue to lead by God's grace based upon the word of God. Why? Because repent wasn't the only thing we're called to continue doing. Praying and fulfilling the mission and persevering in faith are as well. Nothing changes about our mission. And in fact, it is very possible that everything that may take place in the two to four years ahead, or however long the Lord sovereignly ordains it, may be the very thing needed to shake people up that don't know Jesus to begin looking for Jesus. Do you know that right now the church in Iran is multiplying so fast that they can't keep up with it? Did you know that? Did you know that ISIS and everything that took place with ISIS actually drove Muslims to the cross of Christ? Did you know that the abuse that's going on in China and the shutdowns, everything, is actually multiplying the church? Tertullian said the blood of martyrs is the seed. What do you mean by that? He means that the more you persecute the church, the more the church grows. Now, I'm not saying, here, please, come in and martyr me. You know, like Paul, I'm going to leave Damascus. You know, but what I'm saying is this. What matters more to you? Does the will of God matter more than anything else to you? And if it does, you're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Because there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. What you have to watch out for, though, is what Malachi said happened to the people in his day. You see, they were given promises of restoration in Isaiah chapter 40 through 66. They were given promises of the lion lying down with the lamb. They were given promises of water in the desert. 
They were given promises of restoration and the peoples of the nations streaming into Jerusalem. They were given the promise of a Messiah who would come anointed by the Holy Spirit and it wouldn't be Cyrus. They were given promise after promise after promise that the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house. And where they are now is under Persian control with no real freedom. And so they began saying, it is futile to serve God. What is the point? The temptation will be for you as a follower of Jesus Christ to step back instead of pressing in. It will be for you to try to maybe take matters into your own hands. It may be for you to become discouraged and say, what's the point of church and the gospel if this is what God's going to do? What did we gain by carrying out his requirements? What do we gain by doing the return in September and spending two days in prayer and fasting? What do we gain by praying for four years and two months? What did we gain? We should just call the arrogant blast. We should just throw in the towel. We should just go along and say, forget it. But then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. We, as the people of God, those of us who have caught the vision of what God wants to do by faith, we will gather together, and we will encourage each other in the Lord, and we will fulfill the vision that God has given this church. We will be part of the greatest awakening we've ever seen. We will see people come in through those doors who are going to get saved at these altars. We will see broken, battered, bruised lives be made whole and experience the hope, healing, and wholeness of Jesus Christ. We will see the people that have been rejected received by Jesus Christ. We will see the prodigals restored. We will see sick bodies made whole. We will see God restore marriages. Why? Because we believe that God is opening a door that no man can shut. So do not give in to fear. Do not give in to rage. Do not give in to confusion. But gather together as the people of God and speak to one another because the Lord listens and hears. And you will be on the side that he says, I will spare them. They are mine. They will make up my treasured possession. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Let us stand in faith and shine like stars in a dark world. I titled this message Heads or Tails because there were a lot of questions and a lot of Christians say, I can't make heads or tails out of this. Hopefully now you can. Any foundation built on sand will not endure. The Lord chooses the one he will use as a servant. Character matters. And the Lord will often use a setback as a set up for his glory to be revealed. Now I invite you to some more worship. Come on down, worship team. Lord, I thank you that you stuck Malachi chapter 3 in the Bible. They knew what it was like to look around and be discouraged. They knew what it was like to look around and wonder, is it worth it? But those who feared the Lord spoke to each other, and the Lord listened. Lord, the temptation will be there to be angry and vengeful. The temptation will be there to be fearful. The temptation will be there to be confused, to wonder, God, what's up? Like Asaph of old, it looks like it's not working out until I went into the temple of the Lord, the house of the Lord, and then I saw. Lord, it's good for us to be here today. For those here and those watching this service. Lord, we get so caught up sometimes and we begin to equate a political party with Jesus and the kingdom of God. But every system built on sand will not endure. But the church will. <laughs> the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And I pray that the church would rise as salt and as light, because both are going to be needed in the days ahead. Thank you that each day you'll give us your mercy. Each day you will renew your faithfulness to us. And each day you will open to us doors of opportunity that nobody can shut. <laughs> 
Twitter can't shut it down. Facebook can't shut it down. No one can stop the spread of the gospel because this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end comes. May we be found faithful. May we be found faithful through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
worship team is going to lead us in one more song in just a moment. And I'll give you an opportunity to bring your tithes and offerings to the Lord. Uh, just a reminder that uh, Mike up in the television studio, he does not show people giving. Um, he puts up a different slide so no one knows, so you're able to give freely. Um, and so I just wanted to assure you of that. But I want to read to you a prayer that Paul prayed for the church of Ephesus. He wrote this during the time that Nero was emperor of Rome. Nero was certainly not a Christian emperor in any, by any stretch of the imagination. But here's what Paul prayed, and I pray this for us. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that be, can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Lord, that prayer I pray for us as a people of God. That we would recognize where real power lies. Where real authority rests. And that we would understand that it rests with you on behalf of the church that you are head of the church and that headship, that authority that you have, you gave us a commission. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples. So Lord, you've equipped us. You have empowered us with good news. May we share it. May we live it. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we worship, I just encourage you to come on down and place your offering in the plate. Both of them are for tithes and offerings.
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, which means let the Lord smile on you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the grace of our God.